Legal Edition. I'm your host, Attorney Mary Kay Alloyan. Our guest today is Dr. Dale Jorgensen. He is the Samuel W. Morris University Professor of Economics at Harvard University, and he is a winner of several prestigious awards in the field of economics and author of over 36 books. The show topic is Managing the Risks of Climate Change While Averting Economic Disaster. This will be an overview with Dr. Jorgensen. Let's welcome. Welcome, Dr. John. I'm very happy to be here. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Now, let's start with the uh, recent uh, New York Times article about the EPA um, guidelines. Do you want to uh, expose upon that? Well, I'll be glad to. Uh, this morning's New York Times had a story about the role of climate change as an issue in the Obama administration going forward. And what it said is that the initiatives that are underway at the Environmental Protection Agency um, represent a major uh, initiative on the part of the President, the White House, uh, the administration, and uh, the nation. So uh, this is a very, very important uh, issue, and the President uh, intends to focus a lot of attention on it. Okay. And what do you see happening as a result of these new guidelines? Well, I think that uh, we have to think of the context here. Mm -hmm. uh, the State Department is already at work on a, an agreement, an international agreement, that would involve the United States and will be negotiated in Paris next year, in uh, 2015. This is something that is part of an initiative of the United Nations and uh, is called the United Nations uh, Climate Change uh, Convention. So all the uh, participants in this convention, that's uh, almost 100 countries, will be meeting in Paris to discuss exactly how they ought to coordinate their climate policies. So in general, what they will try to do is to limit the emissions of greenhouse gases, which uh, have been identified as a uh, pollutant in uh, many of these countries, including, of course, in the United States. Now we come to the Environmental Protection Agency. Anticipating this uh, meeting, the uh, United States, of course, uh, until now, has not had a full-fledged national climate policy. But the EPA announced uh, earlier this month that uh, they would initiate a rulemaking under their regulatory authority, the Clean Air Act of 1970 and subsequently uh, amended and so on, to uh, draw up a climate policy through regulation that would be administered by the Environmental Protection Agency. So that's where the EPA comes in. And uh, that was an important uh, subject of this uh, article as well, just exactly what this uh, rule will involve. Uh, obviously, the rule is going to involve many, many different negotiators and participants because the way that we regulate uh, air quality in the United States involves a coordination between the EPA at the federal level and the environmental agencies at the state level, including here in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. And each state will be assigned a quota that uh, it will have to meet in terms of reduction of emissions of greenhouse gases. This is a process that will probably go on for a couple of years and could very well extend beyond the uh, Paris meeting that I alluded to. So those are the uh, big steps. They are the Paris meeting in 2015, the EPA rulemaking, which is uh, now underway, and the uh, participation of all the state authorities that will have to meet these uh, targets that have already been announced by the EPA. Mm -hmm. So it sounds like a, there is a coordinated effort by this country, this administration, and, and, and foreign administrations to combat this greenhouse gas issue that has been uh, in the media for some time. So it sounds like there is a coordinated effort. and. Um, how do you see that effort uh, playing out? Do you feel that some of the countries will actually, uh, you know, take steps in the right direction? Or does the U.S. have to actually implement them before you think that they will implement their own? Well, uh, a little bit of history. So we have to remember that this uh, U.N. Framework Convention that I mentioned is something that uh, has been around since the 1990s. The key agreement that uh, took place in the 90s is called the Kyoto Protocol. It right. was negotiated in uh, Kyoto, Japan. 
And uh, many, many countries have agreed to the terms of the Kyoto Protocol, which involved uh, setting limits on uh, greenhouse gas emissions, specifically on carbon dioxide. But it's very important to recall the U.S. never agreed to the protocol. That's right. The uh, U.S. Uh, negotiators, in fact, uh, uh, signed an agreement uh, in uh, Kyoto, but it was never ratified. It would have to be ratified, of course, uh, under the treaty powers of the U.S. Constitution. Mm -hmm. So uh, that never took place, and therefore the U.S. until this point has not been a uh, participant. So the negotiation in Paris is about what succeeds the Pro Kyoto Protocol. Mm -hmm. And the idea is that there would be an agreement involving all the adherence to the Framework Convention that would uh, bring about uh, international coordination to uh, limit uh, greenhouse gas emissions and would represent an international agreement on uh, climate policy. We've had such an agreement, the uh, Kyoto Protocol, but because it didn't involve the United States, it was uh, relatively ineffective. So what we're looking forward to is the possibility that this new international agreement could involve something with uh, teeth and uh, could really uh, change the prospects for uh, maintaining, hopefully, and uh, maybe even improving our environment. Mm. From what you know, will China and Indi India be at the table for that convention? They will be at the table, and uh, they've been participating in these uh, international discussions, which take place every year. Uh, but uh, whether they are going to be full participants remains to be seen. One of the features of the Kyoto Protocol was that only industrialized countries like the United States were asked to limit their greenhouse gas emissions. But now China is the leading emitter of greenhouse gas uh, gases uh, in the world. Yes. Uh, they surpassed the United States some years ago. So it's very important to have uh, China as uh, part of the agreement. And so that's an issue to be decided. As far as India is concerned, they are well on the way to uh, being at least number three because uh, their emissions are about half those in uh, China despite a uh, similarity of their uh, populations. So once again, it's very important for India to participate. So without the participation of India and China as well as the uh, industrialized countries like the United States and European countries and so on, uh, I think that it wouldn't be possible to have a uh, a, an international agreement that would have much effect. Now the Obama administration uh, has decided to act and they're going to be acting through the EPA. Uh, one of the reasons too, I, I want to bring this issue home, if they do not act and carbon emissions continue to rise, mm -hmm. and we are going to have more catastrophic storms that are predicted by scientists around the globe which in essence will cause more monetary uh, losses mm -hmm. by the federal government. Right. So Sandy was one of them, mm -hmm. um, and there will be more to come. And the question is, where is that money going to come from to rebuild these communities and these major losses? Uh, do you want to uh, clarify that? Well, I think that uh, the first thing to focus on is that this is a very, very gradual process. It's important to deal with climate issues uh, now. It's not uh, something that we should postpone any further. We've already postponed it uh, considerably, even mm -hmm. since uh, Kyoto. But it's been on the agenda. So uh, people are now, I think, achieving a, an international uh, consensus that uh, there should be uh, action uh, on uh, climate. The question is, what form should that action take? And uh, that's something that uh, also is going to involve a substantial uh, period of time. This uh, will take uh, time to implement and so on. But there's no immediate threat. In other words, the threat that we're talking about is that when greenhouse gases accumulate in the atmosphere, they stay there for a long period of time. To some extent, we're using up a limited amount of capacity for uh, storing these uh, gases in the atmosphere. And that's why it's so important that we think about taking action now. Not that it provides an immediate threat, not that it uh, is necessarily connected with uh, events like uh, hurricanes or uh, major uh, storms or anything like that, but we can already see the prospect of things like uh, an increase in the level of the uh, oceans, like uh, more severe weather, both in terms of uh, temperature, but also in terms of uh, turbulence and uh, precipitation and so on. All of these things uh, are uh, clearly sketched out in the scientific literature. So it's very important to act. 
And uh, at the same time, it's very important to be deliberate mm -hmm. and to, uh, to uh, be sure that uh, we're proceeding in the right direction with the appropriate international coordination. Mm -hmm. Now, I know the EPA rules have been upheld by the Supreme Court, that they have the authority to act right. to regulate. Uh, now, let's talk a little bit about some of the regulations that are going to be going into effect. Um, from what I understand, uh, in in 2020, mm -hmm. uh, the uh, energy companies will um, have the ability to implement other types of uh, carbon scrubbing devices mm -hmm. or carbon mm -hmm. removal devices, mm -hmm. and those need to be fully implemented by 2030, which mm -hmm. is um, 16 years from now. Mm -hmm. um, it seems sort of a long way away, but uh, I know things can... Uh, Time passes quite quickly. So well, what's going to be a, happening? If well, it's uh, very important to uh, think about the fact that uh, all of these moves uh, take time. Mm -hmm. They differ from one uh, situation to another. That's uh, why we have a, a regulatory structure like the one mm -hmm. that we do. So uh, let's think about the EPA. What is the EPA actually doing? They started out with a relatively modest plan in which they decided to add carbon dioxide, which is one of the six leading uh, greenhouse gases, the others being methane and nitrous oxides and mm -hmm. uh, so-called high-impact uh, greenhouse gases. They decided to regulate carbon dioxide as a pollutant under the Clean Air Act. The Clean Air Act was originally intended to clear up uh, sulfur dioxide, things that, you know, get in your throat and uh, create uh, visible air pollution. Particulate matter. Particulate matter uh, especially. And of course uh, that has uh, very important health impacts. But uh, adding carbon dioxide to the list had never been litigated before be, uh, for the Supreme Court until now. And on Monday the Supreme Court decided that uh, this was uh, a legitimate use of the authority granted by the Congress to the EPA under the Clean Air Act. So uh, that was a, a very, very important decision. And it was uh, a decision strongly supported by the Supreme Court. It wasn't, you know, five mm -hmm. to four mm -hmm. with the obvious, uh, you know, conservative and uh, liberal factions. It was supported by uh, people from all sides of the uh, political spectrum. That gave a tremendous boost to the idea of using a regulatory approach. Now let's go back to EPA's uh, second initiative in this area. The first initiative, which was just litigated before the Supreme Court, was to take plants that were renovated, for example, where they added scrubbers or mm -hmm. other features or maybe changed the, the uh, generating facilities in some major way, and treat those as new plants. In other words, require that those satisfy the same criteria as building a plant from scratch. Right. And that's what the Supreme Court decided was appropriate. However, now EPA is saying existing plants, regardless of whether they undertake any kind of major renovation, will be subject to the same kind of regulation. They will have to satisfy criteria which will be promulgated for individual states and enforced by the states uh, through uh, legal proceedings in the same way as other environmental policies. And that's so, a milestone. And that that's, is a milestone. Yes, exactly. So this is what is uh, on the agenda, and uh, this is what will be uh, debated and uh, negotiated between the federal government and the states over the next two years. Now suppose that we go ahead with a uh, program like this. This will take, as you said, decades uh, before it's uh, fully implemented. So uh, we're beginning uh, to implement uh, climate policy. Mm -hmm. And uh, clearly the EPA is taking new initiatives and those will be tested in the courts just like the original uh, regulations uh, were mm -hmm. tested on uh, Monday. Mm -hmm. So uh, we have a long way to go before we have a uh, full climate uh, policy in place, obviously. Mm -hmm. Now, from what I understand in reading some of the new regulations, it didn't seem to include methane, I, it, which troubled me because uh, methane is one of the most potent greenhouse gases. There are a number, and carbon um, is the most widespread, I mm -hmm. understand, but it didn't. Um, do, you, do you have any ideas why that didn't encompass that? Well, uh, at this point, you have to remember that uh, EPA was still litigating before the Supreme Court on the whole issue of whether a particular greenhouse gas, namely carbon dioxide, mm -hmm. should be included in the list of 
pollutants that mm -hmm. are covered by the Clean Air Act. And that was decided by the Supreme Court only on Monday. So the EPA has proceeded very tentatively. They've mm -hmm. said, okay, we have a list of so-called six criterion air pollutants. I mentioned sulfur dioxide, for example. The uh, greenhouse gases include not only carbon dioxide, as you say, methane, nitrous oxides, mm -hmm. and so-called high um, uh, potential uh, uh, greenhouse gases. The EPA is likely to follow up its regulation of carbon dioxide by adding additional uh, pollutants to the list. Mm -hmm. And so the fact that it uh, hasn't included uh, methane, I think, mm -hmm. is not something that uh, is in any way a barrier to including methane at a later uh, stage. But carbon dioxide, as you say, is the most important of these pollutants. Mm -hmm. So clearly that has to be first on the list. Okay. Now let's talk carbon tax. Okay. Uh, that's been uh, an issue that's been debated, thrown around right. quite a bit on the um, state level, federal level, and I hear it's been implemented successfully in British Columbia. That's right. Could you elaborate a little on that? Well, uh, a number of uh, nations and uh, a number of uh, provinces and states and so on have uh, considered the idea of a uh, carbon tax. British Columbia is a, mm -hmm. a very good example where this has been uh, successful and mm -hmm. uh, has been uh, politically popular. It turns out that uh, there's a lot of political support for this. On the other hand, uh, if you had a, uh, t want to take another example, Australia until uh, July 1st of this year, in other words, just in a few days, uh, had a uh, carbon tax in place. But uh, the uh, new administration uh, in Australia has announced that it's going to repeal the carbon tax. So that's an example where uh, there was an initiative, it got all the way through the legal system and uh, ended up uh, without the political support that was needed to uh, maintain it. But what's the attraction of a carbon tax? Right. In one word, simplicity. Uh, it turns out that uh, climate is a global problem. It's not something like uh, particulate matter, which is emitted by a smokestack mm -hmm. and uh, creates uh, health hazards for the people that are downstream. Local level. <clears throat> it's something that uh, affects everybody in the globe. So mm -hmm. our emissions of greenhouse gases, China's emissions, India's emissions, all go into a global pool of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere. And this eventually diffuses in such a way that the concentrations are more or less uniform all over the globe. So we have to think of this as a global problem. Now, how do we coordinate our activities with nations that are as different from the United States as China or India? Well, what most economists uh, believe is that the simplest way to uh, do that would be through a uniform carbon tax that would apply across the globe. And so that would mean that every nation would adhere to an agreement in which they would arrive at a carbon tax and adjust it periodically in such a way as to achieve a global climate policy that would be simple, would be transparent, would be understandable, and uh, would also minimize the uh, cost of uh, control. What, who would be in charge of setting those uh, costs on the carbon? Would it be the individual countries themselves? No, no. Uh, if you uh, think about uh, the way a climate policy would work around the globe, it obviously makes sense to have the same tax everywhere because these emissions mm -hmm. contribute to a, a common uh, global pool. So every country has to agree on a tax that would be the same for everybody. And uh, that's what uh, makes the international negotiations simple because the objective is clear, but also uh, difficult uh, to uh, deal with because uh, people are going to say, well, there are various reasons why we shouldn't be included. And that's the kind of debate that has been going on uh, now for the last couple decades. So developing company, uh, countries, excuse me, developing countries would say, well, you know, we don't have the means to pay a higher carbon tax versus developed countries. Right. Well, that's the uh, key thing. So uh, I've written a book, which is on the uh, table here, called mm -hmm. Double Dividend, uh, which uh, essentially explains why this works for China as well as for the United States. The double dividend is improving the climate, in other words, maintaining the uh, quality of our uh, climate, avoiding all the dire consequences that you've uh, been alluding to. Mm -hmm. And secondly, improving the economy, improving the performance of our economy, improving the uh, performance of the Indian economy, the Chinese economy, and so on around the world. How do we do that? 
by integrating environmental taxes into the rest of our tax system and using the revenue that is produced, whether it's in China, India, or the United States, to reduce taxes in the country where the carbon tax is collected. So what does that mean for the United States? What it means is that we could reduce our tax burden outside the area of climate policy, and that would improve the performance of the economy. Simultaneously, by imposing a carbon tax, we could protect the climate, and we would have the benefit of this double dividend that would improve the economy while improving the environment. Mm -hmm. From what I understand in British Columbia, the folks over there actually get money back um, based upon um, their carbon footprint, I believe? Exactly, that's right. So uh, that's a uh, key idea, what to do with the money. And that turns out to be the key to the economic impact. In other words, opponents of a carbon tax or more generally of climate policy are going to uh, argue that uh, imposing a tax is going to lead to distortions that will make it uh, uh, difficult for our economy to be competitive. Right. And uh, so uh, what can we do about that? Well, the answer is that we have to make our uh, economy competitive by using the revenues to offset other taxes. That's the idea that is uh, already in use in many jurisdictions, including uh, in uh, British Columbia. But I think uh, many Americans and probably many uh, other people in other countries are somewhat distrustful. Will that money really get used for the purpose for which it is intended? Well, again, the purpose for which it's intended is to reduce climate mm -hmm. uh, damages. And uh, so it will certainly reduce climate damages. Mm -hmm. uh, that's something that uh, I think uh, has been uh, thoroughly proved by uh, scientists, by economists, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. by business people. However, uh, what we have to think of is what is the effect of using the revenue in different ways and then choose the one that uh, improves our competitiveness. And that's exactly the calculation that every country in the world is going to be doing mm -hmm. if there is some kind of international agreement. Mm -hmm. Now the next question I suppose might be, well look, suppose we have a regulatory system run by the EPA and China has a carbon tax. Well, that would uh, give them, obviously, a competitive uh, advantage. Now, why? Why would that give them an advantage? Because their climate policy would generate revenue, which they could use to enhance their competitiveness. Our climate policy would be put forward on a rule regulatory basis and uh, wouldn't produce revenue. So there wouldn't be the opportunity for this double dividend that I've been talking about. So that is the uh, key issue in uh, looking at this from our point of view. How can we uh, make use of this uh, opportunity provided by climate policy, both to uh, deal with the climate issues and simultaneously to avoid harming the economy, and if possible, to actually improve the economy, make it more competitive, create more jobs, and so on. And uh, that's the choice that I think that uh, we have to face. And uh, so I don't think the EPA's regulation will be the end of this debate. I think we'll be hearing a lot about I this for some beginning. time to come. I think it's the beginning of the right. debate. And one thing I want to touch on briefly is, you know, the costs, some of the right. costs of not doing anything. Right. Uh, I think that's very important because there's still a lot of folks that still question the existence of really is there global warming, even though we know the you know, sea, sea levels are rising, the polar caps are melting. Um, can you address some of the costs if we do nothing? Well, uh, the costs are uh, changing the climate in uh, ways that are unpredictable. Uh, since uh, this is certainly going to involve global warming, that's the uh, principal cost, uh, there will be an increase in the average temperature, and that's going to lead uh, to uh, things like melting the Greenland ice cap or melting the Antarctic uh, ice cap and so on. And uh, resulting from that, would be an increase in the level of the oceans. And of course, that's something that is mm -hmm. going to affect uh, every uh, beachfront coast. property, uh, every uh, commercial property that is uh, on the water uh, in the whole world. We're talking about massive damage should uh, such an increase uh, mm -hmm. occur. But at the same time, we have to recognize there is no possibility that we're simply going to stop climate change today. I mean, the, the, the uh, costs are simply 
uh, beyond, uh, beyond reckoning. So the issue uh, that uh, comes up is how can we reduce the damage and reduce the other uh, costs and balance them uh, against uh, one mm -hmm. another. And that's where a carbon tax comes in, mm -hmm. that uh, we could use that to uh, do this in the most efficient way, and we could avoid these damages that would occur if we do nothing. Mm -hmm. And uh, so doing nothing, I think, is uh, really not an option. Now, you exactly. might say, is it a political option? Is this a politically viable uh, policy? I think the answer is no. I think that uh, the business community, the uh, political community, uh, have uh, pretty much arrived at a, a consensus. That doesn't mean that everybody has to agree. Uh, our uh, Constitution doesn't require <laughs> unanimity. It requires a majority. And I think we now have a, a strong majority in the communities that really matter for this decision to uh, act on climate change. Mm -hmm. The question is, how should we act? So uh, the damages are, are uh, horrific if you think about mm -hmm. the uh, very long term, you know, 50, 100, uh, 200 years. But uh, if you think about actions that we could take in the meantime, we could uh, mitigate these damages and we could mm -hmm. avoid damaging the economy. Yeah, we need to mitigate these damages because when we have property damage, when we have casualties, right. more workers getting injured in the fields because of the heat, right. also the storm surges, it's all mm -hmm. costing money. And insurance companies are not going to want to underwrite coastal communities. They're not going to want to underwrite uh, issues that have to do with uh, hurricanes and tornadoes of the magnitudes that we've been seeing. Right. And then the federal government will have to step in and FEMA will have to pick up the tab. And where is that money going to come from? Well, I don't see the uh, scenario unfolding uh, in quite that way. In other words, I don't think it's likely that uh, anybody is going to be picking up the tab for people who have uh, beachfront properties or uh, commercial real estate that's uh, going to be vulnerable. I think the fact is that the only way that people can deal with that is to uh, manage their own property in such a way that they can uh, reduce the damages as much as possible. And so having the uh, government uh, step in, it's just not an option because the losses potentially are astronomical. Right. There's no way that uh, the government, government intervention of that sort mm -hmm. uh, could uh, deal with the uh, issue. There's magnitude. another issue that economists would be concerned about, which is what kind of incentives does that give people to take the appropriate actions right. to locate their beachfront property back from the water, to uh, build uh, commercial real estate uh, in areas that are protected from uh, the increase in the uh, sea level rise. In order to make sure that those decisions are made in the most appropriate way, we have to provide the incentives. And the way to provide those incentives is to give each individual and each uh, corporation the incentives they need to make the right decisions. So I don't see a role for the government or for FEMA uh, to uh, step in. And uh, I think that's not on the horizon. Right. Uh, from a standpoint of a last last ditch option when insurance mm -hmm. won't cover, um, we know that the government has stepped in, but if it's catastrophic, um, they will not be able to. Yeah, so an example would be uh, flood coverage. We know that uh, the uh, federal government pro provides subsidized uh, flood insurance uh, for uh, people that are exposed to flooding from rivers or spills from uh, uh, lakes or whatever and uh, at rates that don't reflect the commercial uh, cost of, of uh, providing the insurance. However, uh, if we think about uh, what the government does in response to a hurricane, for example, or some other uh, uh, catastrophe related to extreme weather, uh, the government doesn't step in and simply say, well, we're going to help everybody. Uh, they may uh, try to help people resettle, you know, uh, but it's not something where they're simply going to say, your beach house was wiped out, here's a check that uh, will enable you right. to rebuild right. it in exactly the same place. Right. And my, not not, not going right. to happen. Unfortunately, we have to stop. Um, but thank you for joining us. And I want to thank our viewers for tuning in. Uh, we've been uh, discussing climate issues with, uh, and economics with Dr. Jorgensen. And please remember this information is for informational purposes only. It's not legal, business, or professional advice. And please visit our website for more information, thelegaledition.com. We look forward to seeing you next time.